everybody. Thank you for coming back to Muse TV. I'm Mike Sandoval. And today I got the director of 18th and Grand, the Olympic Auditorium Story, Stephen Debro. Where did the idea come up? Because this is such a great documentary and a great story of the city of Los Angeles. How did you put everything together? What was the idea about telling the story of the Olympic Auditorium? Well, the I mean, the Olympic was in my... I mean, growing up in LA, the Olympic was sort of omnipresent. If you're of a certain age, just it was always on TV. Um, and a friend of mine was working on a photo project um, about, you know, with the work of Theo Arendt, um, who was the house photographer at the Olympic from the, uh, the mid 60s to the early 80s. And um, as I dug into that, I got more I just got fascinated by the story and um, and it became this sort of interesting tentacle on which to tell a larger story about Los Angeles um, through this building. Um, yeah, and this building has held some of the greatest events. Before there was a sport, an LA sports arena that was built around the 60s, there was the Olympic Auditorium. And the names, the people who have been in those doors who have not only performed, played music, freaking boxed. It, it's just such a legendary history. To go through all that archival footage, how much, how fascinating was it? Especially like both of us grew up in LA. So we know what the Olympic Auditorium meant to us. It's, it's, it's still, it's an ongoing fascination. It, it's amazing the stuff, the, the, the materials that, um, are unlodged, you know, every time I do, uh, you know, as this project has gone along um, from the very beginning when, and then when we started social media and did a Kickstarter campaign and started getting some notice for the project, um, interesting relics would come forth and incredible connections um, to people with stories and 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 material. So, um, you know, recently someone uh, shared with me the Jack Dempsey. There, the Olympic used to be lined with all of these hand tinted photographs of fighters, boxers, and wrestlers. And um, someone uh, was given Eileen Eaton, the woman who ran it, gave this person's uncle who was a regular at the Olympic, this, the Jack Dempsey, um, you know, picture. And he shared it with me, um, shared me, I haven't seen it physically yet, but he shared the picture of that with me, which was just like incredible. Cause everything was basically discarded when, um, you know, in the early eighties, when they renovated the place, they started stripping away all those details and all of that history from the, um, you know, from those pictures to ultimately the facade and a lot of the details on the wall. And of course the Jack Dempsey mural that adorned the front of the building at 18th and Grand. Yeah. And that's a, like some of those interviews that you were able to really get are so fascinating. And it's to get that firsthand knowledge of what the building it's it's like what the building has become and uh it's it's the interviews were great like these these were great interviews and such insight i even learned more about the building that i didn't even know about yeah you. well it, it it you know i wanted the more i dug into it I, I wanted hopefully the viewer to take you know i hope that the joy of the the movie comes through it and that's sort of the part of that is my eyes of discovery and of of getting to speak with such an incredibly interesting and varied group of people. Um, I love the people. I love. I've gotten to form really strong relationships with um, you know with so many people who are part of the Olympic, you know, and and had to and I went through the loss of some of those people as they passed away, but I felt very grateful to um, that the people were willing to share their stories with me. And I tried to go in there whenever I, I interviewed someone was to be both 
um, prepared, <laughs> number one, and to be respectful of them and curious. I, I, I was learning along the way and I wanted to, you know, ask those questions and form a historical record, not just to sort of, I think a lot of times that in documentaries, you know, people have a specific need for someone to say certain things in the doc that will tell, help someone tell the story. And um, for the most part, we really, you know, especially early on would do very long form interviews with people because I wanted to make sure, I was thinking this may be the only time to ask, you know, to, to get in front of this person. And I want to know what, what drove them to the Olympic? What, how were they connected? Um, what were their stories? How did the Olympic affect their lives? And, and really, you know, and in that process, people got to trust me. And I tried to reciprocate that by representing people in a way that was respectful of them in the furtherance of telling this, this bigger story and, and humanize everyone who was, was part of it. And I think that, I, I hope that comes across in the film as well, that, that there's, a, um, there's a curiosity and a, and a warmth to it of, of wanting these people to let them express their feelings um, honestly in the movie. And that's what I like, because you don't, and I think only somebody who was born and raised in LA gets this, is that you encompass the whole city, the south side, the east side, the west side. You really encompass it in the central location, because that's the one thing. I grew up in the east side, and I love the story that you tell about the pachucos and everything else that you go into, and going into the boxing and how it relates and how the community comes together. Talking about Muhammad Ali and working with Eileen and how that came up. Those are stories that people seem to, as we're getting more people coming in from other states, don't really know about LA and don't really see about LA and how much LA has played an influence in sports and entertainment. Absolutely. And 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 I think that that was one of the that was another goal in, in making the movie was to do an LA documentary that actually represented the whole city. And you know, uh, Gary Tovar, uh, who's the founder of Golden Voice uh, Promotions, first, he said something that didn't make it into the film, but that was really um, salient, I think, which is the Olympic was like, you know, it was like the heart at the center of the city and the freeways were like the veins or the, you know, the, the ventricles, whatever, um, leading in and out of this sort of the center of the city. And, um, and so if you look at LA, like the, the Olympic is the middle, then the tentacles reached out all throughout the city. And I wanted to try to get a bit of that whole experience of the city and what unifies it and divides it, you know? And I think that's sort of what the movie is about too, is about our conflicts as much as what, what sort of puts us together and all of the fights at the Olympic kind of represent the larger fights that were having in society too. So it, 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 there's just a lot of, the more I kind of dug in, the more I, I realized that, that there are just so much, um, there was so, so many ways to talk about the city through this building um, and, and, and allow it to express itself in a way that, you know, the music to me was really important. And all the music is related to LA or the Olympic in one way or another, the artists are from LA, or they, you know, with Dead Kennedys, for example, they played the Olympics. So I had a little rule when I was making this was just like, I want all the textures to feel, to an Angelino, to feel note perfect, to like, to feel like this is my city, this represents LA. And I felt like if that works, you know, one of the, the, the little critiques that some of the people have said to me who weren't from LA are just like, is this too niche? And I'm like, I don't feel it's niche in LA. LA is, fa the, the, the world is fascinated by Los Angeles and we drive culture. Yeah. And, and so to me, I felt like, you know, criticize me about anything, but I don't feel like it's niche. I feel like is Muhammad Ali or Andre the Giant niche? Is, is, is Raging Bull or Rocky? Are those niche things? They happened in LA. They happened at the Olympic Auditorium and those were worldwide phenomena. So I, 
you know, I appreciate you you feeling that way as that Angelino thing that you know I I was born and raised here too, and it and it I wanted to make sure it was accurate accurately reflecting the city that I grew up in. Yeah, and I I've, I've had that situation where people will I'll debate with people who came from other states and didn't grow up here, and will and I'm like sometimes with different movies I'm kind of like he doesn't really they say it's a true love story in L.A. but I don't know where the LA is in this love story. <laughs> it's like and agreed. Me too. Really is. Me too. Me uh-huh. too. And and that was that was a part of. I was like, you know, they're actually. I was thinking like there aren't. There are some very good LA documentaries, plenty of them. But I, I was like, nothing that's come at the city from this angle. And 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 I wanted to. I was like, it's sounds dopey to say, but I was like, I want to make one of the great LA documentaries. I want to make a, a documentary that actually like gives more of a sense of the city in all its different textures and experiences than has ever been shown before to give it that, that the respect that I think the city is, is, deserves in that way and, and treat the communities with that same degree of respect. So um, that was, there were a lot of kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, I had to thread a lot of needles, I felt like in this movie in, in trying to make the narrative all work and and make sure the fans got what they wanted to. I wanted, you know, the roller derby people, They, I wanted to make sure that, you know, even if it wasn't a huge, huge, you know, section of the film that when it was on the screen, it felt like roller derby that it was really representative of that and same with wrestling and boxing of course and um and then um and and punk and of course eileen's story you know that was really important and how eileen was just and this is the one thing i really truly love is that you showed how eileen was a trailblazer in this business and how important she was to this the business which was really yeah I mean, I think Eileen is a forgotten LA character. I mean, I feel like Eileen is one of the most, you know, like, I wouldn't say dissed, but if you think about people that really helped shape culture in Los Angeles and was a brilliant business person who who was able to use the medium of television so well, um, who was such a, her attention to detail, you know, Dick Enberg, you know, talks about her, um, you know, with, he was intimidated by her, but she taught him so much about how much she, you know, said she cared about her product and she respected the fans. Like, that's another thing that I think many sports fans long for is, you know, and, and, and boxing right now, especially in, in a lot of ways is, is to treat the fan with the utmost respect, um, you know, and, and give, you know, res- really give fans value for their dollar. And I think she did that. And she knew that the Olympic, you know, the prices were approachable, mm-hmm. you know, reg- everyday fans could go to the Olympic for, you know, something like two bucks to get in sometimes to dollar fifty, two fifty. you could get in, you know, to sit in the rafters and ringside seats for a long time were, were very inexpensive. So, it was it was a place of 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 access, um, and where the fans got their money's worth, whatever it was. You know, she wanted to make sure the fans got their money's worth, and and I think that's cool. Um, and w- I wish there was more of that now. Um, Same here, because only a couple blocks away, those tickets are not affordable to go to a Staples Center. <laughs> anything no oh, I, I yeah I mean I I love I'm a Lakers fanatic and and I, I I love them and I I but um how often do I really feel like shelling out that kind of money I mean I'll, I'll watch them on TV every so often or if someone gets so like I got an extra ticket I'd love to go you know but but it's it's a it's a pricey it's a pricey thing and um and you know no I understand on a lot of levels why salaries are what they are and 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 everything has gotten you know sports are different now it's much more corporate and it's much bigger money and i i get it but at the same time um there's something to be said for you know what uh an everyday working person could get for their dollar at the olympic auditorium which was 
reliably dynamic entertainment, whether it was roller derby or boxing or wrestling or music or whatever. It was, you know, they cared about the show they put on. And, um, and I think that was cool. And uh, just to wrap everything up, the Olympic Auditorium, the building is still there. It's no longer a place where you see sports and entertainment. It's a church now. Yes. Do you, hypothetically thinking, do you ever think that maybe the, uh, there is an opportunity that the Olympic would make a comeback for smaller venues? I mean, you never say never. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where, I mean, the, city, the one thing this film has kind of shown me is that the city is ever changing and the things you think of as permanent disappear. And those lives that, you know, that, that you have in your life. And we're all, obviously we're always, we're all gonna come and go at some point and COVID has made that sadly, sadly clear. Um, but um, you never know. I, I, I give the Koreans respect for this, that they didn't tear the building down. And, you know, um, and they use it as, as a place of worship. And, um, and so, you know, I, I, would it be great to see it as a venue again? Of course it would. I would love to see that. I think that it would, it, it has stood the test of time. It's 95 years old. Um, you know, it would be neat. It would, it would need some, some uh, polishing and some upgrading for sure. Those bathrooms, I've been in there and the bathrooms upstairs are still the same. They're still too small and they're still, uh, you know, um, I won't, spoiler alert, I'll leave that alone in the movie. But in any case, um, yeah, it would need upgrading, but it would be great if it was a venue again. But but um, it's great to see it still there. You drive by the freeway to know like, hey, that's the building where all of these amazing thing ha things happened. And, you know, who knows what the future holds as long as they don't tear it down. I, uh, you know, I, I think uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm supportive of their mission. I would love to see something else, but you know, hey, uh, not my call. <laughs> exactly, but you did an amazing job with this documentary. Okay. Uh, there's a reason why Slam Dance, you wanted this documentary to be the close of the festival and it was well-deserved, well-earned. Uh, my father, I shared the, I got a link to watch the documentary, I shared it with my father. My father loved it. Oh, great. And going to the Olympic Auditorium brought back a lot of memories for him. So I, I think you did an amazing job and a really true, great love letter to Los Angeles. How are people going to be able to see it since uh, if in case they missed it at the Sam Dance Film Festival? Well, we'll we're going to have some limited, limited uh, virtual screenings um, coming up that are part of festivals. Um, you know, we were very fortunate this time around because um, you know, we were able to have uh, a live event um, in a time of, of, you know, the edge of the pandemic, hopefully edging towards better, but, but um, we're looking to do more, more virtual and physical events and uh, hopefully playing soon on a, you know, on a streaming venue near you, but we're, uh, we're just, it's just getting out there. This was our premiere and there's much more to come. Awesome. If people, can, if people wanna um, you know, follow us, we're on um, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, but, but go to our website uh, at 18thandgrand.com. Uh, that's 18th, number 18thand, grand.com. And they can sign up for more information and uh, uh, connect to our social media through there. Um, but it will, lots of information coming ahead. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We're definitely going to check out Muse TV. We'll post some more so that you can find out and watch it when it's available again. But Stephen, thank you so much. Great documentary, great work. And I'm looking forward to what you got next because hopefully it's another love letter to Los Angeles, another documentary that really- Oh, there's lots of, lots of things in mind. Yeah. Uh, lots of exciting, fun things in mind. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate okay. it. Thanks very much, Michael.